Our next speaker is an award-winning Afghan-American journalist. She wrote a book called Opium Nation. It's a uh, fabulous story. So please welcome Fariba Noah. Um, good morning, everyone. Are you guys still awake? Okay, good. Um, Darius men forgot to mention one thing, that he's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Um, mine is that of a refugee story as well. But it's a little different than what you normally hear of refugee stories. I was 10 when I came to this country, but I grew up the first part of my life in Afghanistan, in a hometown, and my hometown is called Herat. It's on the Iranian border, and it's actually um, the wealthiest province in Afghanistan, and it's a beautiful place to live. I grew up in an orchard home, um, and refugee stories you hear are often about young boys and girls escaping war-torn countries, coming to the United States and finding peace and happiness and opportunities in this country. That wasn't the case with me in the beginning because I remembered life back home as this orchard, and we all should live in an orchard at some point in our life. I had over a dozen, or two dozen, cousins, and my, it was my grandparents' orchards, and I, my memory of it was running around under pomegranate trees, and we had um, these mulberry trees, which you don't get many in the United States, and uh, the kids were given these large sheets each one of us cousins would hold the corner of the sheets, and my uncles would go and up, uh, up on the pomegranate trees or the, the mulberry trees, and they would shake the branches, and all of the mulberries would fall onto the sheet, and it was put in a large tray. We would wash it in the creek that was in the orchard, and then everyone would sit around and eat mulberries. It was those smells, the taste, the fresh air that I missed. But all of that was ruptured by the bloodshed of war during the Soviet Union. My school was bombed, and I witnessed one of my classmates beheaded by a rocket. And no child should ever have to see something like that. My parents were fairly well off. We were from the educated upper class. My father was a civil servant. My mom was a homemaker. And they had everything there. But we didn't have security. My parents decided to leave after the school bombing. They decided to give up everything they had, and they decided that it was time to live for their children. So we emigrated as refugees. And we didn't sit on a plane like Darius's dad and come to the United States. He left about 10 years before that, I think. We, we had to rent two donkeys, and we sat on, I, we didn't get to sit on the donkeys, we put our all, our belongings on the donkeys, and we crossed the desert that was then the front line between the Mujahideen and the Soviet Union. And I remember crying for water because the desert water was too salty. Until six hours later, we reached the Iranian border, and then a few days later, we went to, uh, to Pakistan, where there was an exodus of Afghan refugees. At one point, there were six million of us in the world, the largest in the entire world. Ten months later, <clears throat> with my blonde braids, Yes, there are blondes in Afghanistan, and I happen to be one of them. And I always have to legitimize my voice as an Afghan woman because the image of an Afghan woman to many Americans is dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes, and a scarf on with a long skirt. No, and of course the burqa. We don't all look like that. I had twin blonde braids, knee-high socks, and a spaghetti strap dress when I stepped off the plane with my mother, father, and sister in Fort Dallas, Fort Worth when we came here, and I hated it. There were no orchards. We lived in the back of a house in a garage. And then we came to California because this is where our relatives were. Fremont, California is home to the largest Afghan community in the United States. It's called Little Kabul. And slowly, we started to find another home. My father was a civil servant, as I mentioned. He used to be a writer. He came from a family of intellectuals, and he became a nobody. My mother became very physically ill, and she had to get health care, which was available for her. So this story of opportunities back in the US, it took a while. And for my parents, it never came. They looked to us to change things. 
and we decided that we had to. There was no choice. My brother, my sister, and I were put, uh, we were responsible for supporting the family. Um, and in the end, it was very difficult for me to navigate American culture. I became a nerd. That's where I found my solace. And I found some misfit friends like myself. The middle school where I went in Union City was half of the girls were pregnant by the eighth grade, and half of the boys were in jail. This is the school where I went. So I found it very strange. I didn't understand it, I didn't fit in, and I wasn't happy in America. I kept asking my parents, when can we go back? When can I go back to the orchard? And they said, we're not going back. You're just going to have to get used to this place. Um, there was that survival guilt that Mark talked about last night, but more so there was this nagging nostalgia. And those of you who are immigrants understand what I'm talking about. It, there's, as an exile, you're constantly dealing with the sense of, I want the sights, the smells, the sounds of what is back home. Back home. And when you do eventually go back, you never find it. It's, all, it's changed to be another place. And so throughout high school, I was always looking um, for some kind of acceptance for some kind of home. And I actually slowly started to understand and to fit into America. How it was in my teachers uh, who I found friends. The, the teachers became my friends. They were excellent in helping me learn English, in helping me feel accepted as an American. And um, I started to write. My 12th grade, uh, my, I'm sorry, my, when I was 12, my 7th grade teacher told me that you can write. You should actually think about writing. And I said, oh, writing, but that doesn't, you know, as an immigrant child, you're like, well, that doesn't make any money. <laughs> so I'm going to be a journalist. And the journalism was the perfect combination because I could travel, which I'd love to do. I could get to know others and tell stories, and I love storytelling. Um, and... Actually, it wasn't really a choice. It was a calling. It was a passion. And I still do this today. And I can't imagine doing anything else. And it became a way of healing my pain, of telling my stories. It, it sort of became therapeutic. I started writing at the age of 16, and I started getting published then. And then the one thing I wanted to do was go back home. So I went to college, graduated college. I ran away from the Afghan community as far as I could to Massachusetts. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college there called Hampshire. And then I uh, returned to work for a daily newspaper in Fremont. Two years later, I wanted to go, and I, I did. I did what most parents would advise you not to do. I quit my job, and I flew to Pakistan. And I started write, writing about the refugee community there, the Afghans that never had the chance to come to the US. It, and then I decided to go home. And this was still when the Taliban were in power. So I put a burqa on, and I crossed that same border again from Iran. And this time I was in a taxi cab. And when I went back to Herat, I stood on the orchard roof, and I overlooked the city. And everything had changed. I started to sob, because that's when you come to terms with the fact that you're never going to go home again that it's not going to be the same again. The place that turned into a dust bowl, the stadium where there used to be festivals, was now a field for executions of women, of gays, of anybody who was different than what the Taliban wanted. I was told to put away my pen and my paper because they were more afraid of that than the gun. So I did. I worked undercover, literally. And then I went back to Kabul and back to Pakistan. I got a job with AFP, Agence France Presse, in Iran, but I didn't get the visa. So I had to return back to the US. I decided to go to grad school in NYU. So on September 11, 2000, September 11, 2001, I was a graduate student in Brooklyn. I lived in Brooklyn when the planes hit. My roommate, one of my roommates, his name was Osama. Osama told me to come on upstairs, there's something going on. Two days before, Ahmad Shah Massoud had been killed in an assassination attempt. He was the leader of the Mujahideen who was fighting the Taliban at the time. I knew as soon as I went up on that roof and watched the smoke, and uh, watched the World Trade Center go up in smoke, that my two countries were about to go to war. 
that my two identities were finally going to collide, literally. I did what I had to do. I quit school, I returned back to Pakistan, and I went back into the field, and I started to report. I was working 17-hour days writing the stories of Afghans. And before 2011, it was really hard to sell stories because nobody cared about Afghanistan, just like they're going to once the troops leave. No one's going to care. We have a very short memory as Americans um, about other countries. We, we forget very quickly our wars. And, and then I finally went back, and I started to travel cross-country this time in 2002. I traveled with a, a, a Spanish a woman and a, um, a Spanish journalist and a German photographer. And we would stop province to province, and we would ask people what they thought of the Americans uh, inside Afghanistan, how they felt, what were their lives like, sort of gauging the mood of the country. And they were talking about something that nobody else was. None of the press was reporting on this. They weren't, they weren't talking about the American occupation, invasion, intervention, call it what you want. They weren't talking about the Soviet invasion. They were talking about the opium trade. They were talking about drug traffickers. They were talking about how that has affected their life. This had nothing to do with ideology, with religion, with... This was about money, and this was a deadly business that very few people knew about. 90% of the world's heroin comes from Afghanistan. And most of you probably know this now, because Afghanistan is now no longer just a breed of dogs like it was before September 11th. It's a country, and people are now asking me, are you Tajik, are you Pashtun? Um, it's interesting what we know about Afghanistan now. Uh, us amongst ourselves don't ask those questions. We ask, what city are you from? But the information that you're given or the misinformation that you're given is really important because I'm here to sort of take away from that. I, I want to dispel stereotypes as much as possible. And in my book, Opium Nation, I tried to do that. Um, how this became a book, why this became a book, because I was writing daily stories. This became a book because I met a young girl at the end of my cross-country journey with those two journalists. Her name was Daria. I asked my guide, who, tell me what is the most compelling thing about the drug trade for you? And he said, the opium brides. And I said, what is an opium bride? He said, there are these girls. They're being sold into marriage, bartered into marriage by their fathers, by their own families, because their fathers fall into debt, into, uh, in debt to drug traffickers. When they can't pay off their debt, they give cash, land, carpets, and daughters, young virgin daughters. And most of the girls go. Some burn themselves to death, and others resist in different ways. I said, introduce me to one. So he took me to this young girl. And I changed all the names in the book for obvious reasons. And this young girl was amazing. She had green eyes fair skin, very curvaceous. She was 12. And her father had sold her to a man who was 46. Already had a wife, eight kids, and he lived in Helmand province. She was from Herat. She was used to running in the creek, barefoot, going to school, and she was a little girl. He was an old man, and he kept coming to convince her to go, which made him actually very different than other dra drug traffickers. So she was lucky that he wasn't forcing her right away. When I met her, he came to take her again. And I went to interview him. He spoke Pashto, so I had to do it through a translator. And while he was trying to convince me that she had to go with him, she came to me and she tugged on my coat and she said, I know you came from America and I need your help. I don't want to go with this man. Please help me. At that moment, as a journalist, you're taught to stay away from emotional involvement in a story. You're taught, even in my own country, I was very careful not to get emotionally involved. But when you're in that kind of situation, it's very difficult. She locked eyes with me, and she asked me for help. And I didn't know what I could do for her outside telling her story. So this started a journey across the country to talk to drug lords, to understand what the opium trade was about. The husband eventually took her to Helmand. And then her mother asked me to go find her. In 2005, two years later, I took a journey, this time by myself. This was the front line between the British and the Taliban now, where I was told she, where she would be. And uh, she still, she had threatened to self-immolate at that point. Her mother wanted to know if she was still alive and if I could bring her back in any way. 
So I went, again, in a taxi, in a burqa, uh, with a Pashto translator, and I traveled to Helmand. And what happened at the end of that journey is in the book. I won't ruin the book for you, for those of you who want to read it. But essentially, what else I uh, decided to do was go across the country, not just to find this young girl, but to understand how the opium trade is affecting Afghans. And I had a special access to women. So I focused on women, because if you're a foreign man going inside Afghanistan, you're not going to have much access to women because of the culture. They keep uh, their women away from foreign men. It's uh, religiously and culturally improper for them to sit and speak, especially in the villages. But I was able to get in, inside, and because I speak one of the languages, which is Dari or Farsi, um, it was extremely helpful to write their stories in their own voices. And I met Daria, as, who was a victim, but I also met a woman named Parween, who was a farmer who had empowered herself with opium money. She was, she was brilliant. She was actually a very good businesswoman. She, she had an acre of land, she planted poppy, and she made a lot of money from that year's harvest. This is 2004, and this is in the northeast of the country. And she, um, she had a son and a daughter who were married, but they had no income. So what she did with the money was she gave her son some money, and she, she told him, why don't you go buy a car and turn it into a taxi? So that became a source of revenue for her son. She gave some money to her daughter, who knew how to weave carpets, and she, said, she bought her a carpet frame. She said, why don't you weave these carpets and sell it to the foreigners who come to visit, and you can make money that way and support her family. And for herself, it was the first time that she could have three meals a day. And she told me she was going to wean off of poppy, which is what you do, even as an addict. You wean off of it. But what happened to her is that she didn't have the right contacts in the government to bribe. So they came and they eradicated her farm. And it, it was a very compelling and tragic story of what happened after they did that to her. So these were some of the stories that I was able to explore. And at the same time, I was able to reconnect with my homeland. What that journey, how that journey ended is in the book. But my journey, I can tell you about. Um, in the process of the five years that I lived there, from 2002 to 2007, I met my husband in Afghanistan, in Herat. He's an Afghan who grew up in Iran, and he was an IT expert, women's rights activist, vegetarian. <laughs> and if you meet Afghans, that's a rarity, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, we got to know each other over the process of four years, and I told him, you don't belong in Afghanistan right now, you belong in the Silicon Valley. Um, and he is here now. <laughs> we have two small children, but we did live in Kabul for a while, and we had a home with a little orchard with grapevines and a pomegranate tree and an apple tree, and I was very happy uh, in Afghanistan because my work was very meaningful and so was his, but the summer, of 2007, I got pregnant with my first child. And that summer, three bombs went off next to my house. This time, it wasn't the Mujahideen um, killing Soviet soldiers. It was suicide bombers from Pakistan and, and, and t the Taliban trying to kill people like me. Afghans coming back to work with NGOs, any, any kind of American involvement. Uh, the last bomb hit our windows. And on the last day that I was leaving, uh, I told my husband, I said, I think I have to cover this story. Uh, at this point, I was three months pregnant. I took him with me, and we went and walked across the debris. There was flesh on trees still, and there was a shop next to, there was a, there was a bakery next to where this happened. And the bakery was operating as if nothing had happened. Some of these people have become so desensitized, but it's also a coping mechanism because they have to keep going. They have to survive. And at that point, it became clear to me that I could no longer stay here as a mother. No matter how much I wanted to stay here and continue telling these stories, I had to leave for the sake of my child. I grew up as a child of war. I do not want my child to go through the same thing. So that day I left with the intention of not coming back until there was more stability in Afghanistan. And we came here, we've been here, but we plan to go abroad again. And this time I want to take my, my children to a place that's safe, but where there's an orchard, where they can pick up the tangy, sweet pomegranate and sink their teeth into it, and I can come home again to them. Because I think home is not in a place anymore, it's in the people who are around you. It's in the people who will make an effort 
to understand you and to empathize with you. Thank you. Thank you.